morning, everyone. Uh, it's me. <laughs> um, it's so, no, 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 that's not what this is about. Um, it is my honor and it is my privilege to get to pray for Pastor Adam as he starts his ministry here. And in reflecting on my time and on how I was able to get to know you as a church body and as a community, there were two words that really stood out to me as I was reflecting. And those words were hospitality and service. This church is a hospitable, hospitable church that really embraces families, embraces people, embraces the hard journeys that we go on and makes room for people to belong and to feel loved. Um, and this church is also a church that serves, a church that looks out for its community, its schools, its neighbors, and tries to love and embrace people truly um, with the heart of Christ. And so I felt that hospitality. I received that service and was able to participate in that with you um, for 17 months, and I am excited that that hospitality gets to be extended to Pastor Adam and his family, to Sarah and Callie and Aiden. I'm excited that they get to join that long history that North Haven has of impacting this community with the love and, and a, a cold cup of water for the neighborhood, um, as well as packing backpacks and shoe boxes and everything else that this church does so willingly and so full of grace. And so, um, I'm excited for the new era, but it's building on a beautiful foundation. And so, in that, with that, let me pray for, for Pastor Adam. Gracious and loving God, God of mercy and forgiveness and God of hope, we are excited and thrilled um, for the start of this new era here at North Haven. Will you please bless Pastor Adam? Bless the words that he speaks, bless the preparation that he has, plus the leadership and guidance that he provides to the staff, and will you please uh, give him the insight into this time that you have for him and this church and this community. God, will you please be with North Haven as they embrace this family, as they love Sarah and Callie and Aiden. May the three of them feel your love and the love of this church. May it be a time of true blessing and a time of true encouragement and, and formation as they grow and, and continue to live in community with these people. God, I'm so thankful for the guidance that you have instilled upon the committee and the elder board and this community to, to get to this point, this exciting time where we get to celebrate the hard work of so many people and ultimately we get to be grateful for the work that you have done to lead to this moment. So God, may your blessing and your grace truly be upon every word, every relationship, um, and every direction from here out. God, we trust that your spirit will guide us and will move us in the path that you have for us. And it is the name of Christ that we ask all of this and that we pray all of this. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Amen. Well, here we go. How's everybody doing this morning? Fantastic. So yes, today is my official first day as the senior pastor of North Haven Church. I couldn't be more excited. Uh, so if you haven't met me yet, uh, yes, my name is Adam Sidler. I am a Minnesota boy. I grew up in um, Apple Valley, actually, and was there all throughout my um, adolescent years, and then ended up meeting my wife. My wife, Sarah, is over here. She is an amazing woman of God, my best friend. We've been married now 14 years, and we met in Indiana. As I'd mentioned before, she grew up in South Florida, so she loves me if she decided to then go up to Minnesota. But we moved up here six and a half years ago, I've been at a church in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, and now we are making the transition. So pray for us as we continue to uh, go through all the, the process of selling our house out there, getting a little closer to uh, the, the community that is North Haven and the surrounding cities here, and then selling our house and all that all that jazz. So I have two amazing kids. My son Aiden, he is nine years old, just turned nine. And my daughter, uh, she is, uh, her name is Callie. She is 12, almost 13. And, uh, uh, you know, she's going into her teen. I'm not prepared for the teenage years. I'm, I'm trying desperately to hold on to this next, last month. Um, she actually, yesterday, just received the first text from a boy. <laughs> I 
I'll get through it. God is good. He is great, and He, prov- he provides when we are lacking um, uh, it ourselves. So anyways, um, meet my family, love on them. Uh, and I was, I've told people this before, the best way that you can encourage me is to love on my family. And uh, so please, if you see them, just uh, you know, welcome them, uh, let them know um, how uh, special they are because they are indeed very special uh, to me. Uh, so a couple of things, uh, little tidbits I want to just get um, out of the way here first. Um, they're important, uh, but first of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who was involved in the summer festival yesterday. That was incredible. I had such a great time. Uh, I got a chance to not only continue to meet people here at North Haven. Now, keep in mind, last time we were here was six weeks ago. I met a lot of people, and I forgot a lot of names. So you have to extend grace to me for that. Um, So I'm going to have to ask you time and time again, what is your name? And please don't be offended by that. Um, It's going to take some time. I was able to do that yesterday, but I also meet people in the community, people who live in this area, being able to shake their hands and to find out a little bit more about them. I prayed for some people as well, and man, what a, just, what a great time. I have been a part of churches now for years and years, been on staff at various different churches, um, you know, big or smaller, it doesn't matter. I got to tell you, what, what you guys did yesterday for the summer festival was on another level. It was wonderful. What a great experience. So thank you. Thank you to everybody who was a part of that. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you. Yeah. So um, also, I want to let you know that starting next Sunday, we're going to start a six-week series that's going to take us into September. Uh, And that series is called Chosen. Now, in that series, we're going to focus on six individuals who were specifically chosen by God, and we're going to look at how they responded to being chosen by God, and then how it is that God responded to how they responded. All right, so it's going to be an amazing series. It's actually a great series to invite people to, so I'd encourage you please to invite your friends, your neighbors, to come and be a part of that series as we journey through God's Word together. Uh, We're going to go through here in just a little bit a very important uh, foundational truth in our relationship to Jesus Christ. But before we do, I'm going to ask that you would pray with me, asking that God would lead and direct not only the words that I speak, but our time together. So let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the goodness that you proclaim. Lord, thank you that you provide uh, the way and the life and the hope everlasting that never fades, that never diminishes, that always remains true. And I pray, Lord, that in our time together today, Lord, that we would remember that your word, Lord, the truth of your word is what should resonate in our hearts. And so those things in our lives, Father, that we have, that we have struggled to maybe give completely to you, those things in our lives, Lord, that we've maybe set aside, we've chosen to ignore, but we, we know that they are keeping us from a right relationship with you. I pray, Father, that you would begin to surface some of those things in our lives. Lord, not to make us feel bad about who we are or what we've done or what we're worried about or anxious about or struggling with, Lord, but to remind us To remind us, Lord, that you so desperately want to walk with us in these things. Lord, that you want to provide the way of life everlasting in each and every single person in this room. That we would be open to what it is that you're speaking to us and that we would then have the courage to respond. Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, we are going to talk today about uh, a, a time in history. We're going to start there, and then we're going to move into what it is that that means for us today. The Reformation, two years ago, celebrated its 500-year anniversary 
The Reformation, as some of you I'm sure understand or know, was this period of time in the 16th century, in the 1500s, where men and women began to challenge some of the ideas and, and principles that were established by the Roman Catholic Church that became contrary to what the Word of God and Jesus had proclaimed. Now, you may have heard the name Martin Luther, and Martin Luther, in the year 1517, he nailed a big piece of paper to the doors of a church in Germany called the 95 Theses. Now, this was a common practice in the day. Actually, in that day, you would do something like that in order to encourage uh, some method of debate. Now, we call that Facebook but back then, they had to nail it to a door. And so Martin Luther, he nailed these 95 theses, and these, these theses were basically areas in which he was challenging these, like I said, these ideas and these principles that the Roman Catholic Church had adopted and was saying were necessary for the Christian life, but that Martin Luther and then later the other reformers were saying, no, no, God's Word says something different. Now, instead of going through all those 95 theses, instead of going through all the, 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 the history that is the Reformation, uh, what I want to focus on specifically are the five solas, uh, the slogans, as you will, the, the five aspects of the Reformation that they kind of hung their hat on and said, these are the five things that we're going to kind of throw everything into and say, all that we are rallying against the Roman Catholic Church can be summarized here. So what are those five solas? What are those five slogans? Well, the first is sola scriptura, which means scripture alone, meaning that, that this Bible, this, the Word of God, stands alone. That was the first sola. The second sola was solus Christus, which meant Christ alone. Jesus Christ alone. The third solo was sola gratia, which means grace alone. That's what we're going to be talking about today. The, the fourth solo was sola fide, which meant faith alone. And then the last one was soli deo gloria, which meant the glory of God alone. And so these five solas, as I mentioned, they summarized and encapsulate, encapsulated all that the Reformers were saying, no, this is what the Word of God says. And so today we're going to look at, as I mentioned, grace alone. Sola gratia. What does grace alone mean? And then specifically as we think about grace, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is grace? What is this word, grace? Some people are named grace. Some people who are named grace don't embody grace, right? Okay, but I, you know, that's, that's, that's another issue. I don't know, but, but grace is used all over by so many different people, including myself. We would see somebody like, for instance, in the Olympics who's figure skating, and you might hear someone say, Wow, she has a lot of grace. Or if I'm in a relationship with you and I'm talking to you, I might say something, hey, if, if I say something that's not a lie, just extend me some grace because, you know, I'm still trying to learn things. We use this word grace, but do we really know what that word means? And then specifically in the realm of God's grace. There's this wonderful definition that I, I want to share with you as a means of, of uh, like a starting point of how we can better understand what God's grace is. Grace means God moving heaven and earth to save sinners who could not lift a finger to save themselves. Grace means God moving heaven and earth, doing everything possible to save sinners. And who are sinners? That's me. That's you. That's us. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's glory. 
Grace means God moving heaven and earth to save sinners. Who could not lift a finger to save themselves? But when we talk about grace, and when we read about grace, when we spend time discussing with one another what grace means, it is hard for us to really fully understand what that is. And for us to really fully accept God's grace. Why is that? It's because not only are we sinners, not only do we fall short, but we also, because of of who we are and our sinful nature, but also the culture in which we live in, we are cynical of anything that's free. Of anything that's free. You get a gift from somebody and you start thinking, oh my goodness, I owe them something. Or I have to write a thank you card right now. Now, for instance, you know, to kind of maybe hope prove this point, I have a $20 bill here, all right? Now, if I came up to somebody and I gave this $20 bill, oh, see, I'm already seeing. <laughs> I, already, I, I saw it right away. He's like, okay, what's the catch? What's he going to make me do, right? We always think there's a string attached when we present something that's free. So if I present this and I say, hey, just go ahead and have it, yo. <laughs> That was wonderful. That was wonderful. See, sometimes we can't even accept it, and so we have to, in order to, in order to feel good about it, we've got to hand it to somebody else, right? right? And we, we think that there's these strings attached. We can't possibly imagine that we could really, truly receive something for free. Now, in order to prove this point even more, yes, there is a string attached. Get that back. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Come on. We don't know each other that well yet. We are a cynical people. We intuitively mistrust. We intuitively begin thinking about what's the catch. And then we unknowingly attribute those kinds of instinctive tendencies to then our relationship with God. That's why it is hard for us to really understand God's grace. And this struggle has been around for a long, long time. A long time. Even during the 1500s when this this Reformation took place and and Martin Luther, amongst others, were challenging this idea of grace. You see, salvation at the time of the Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church was, was basically teaching that if salvation was a check that was written, if they had checks at that time, if it was written, half of that check was written by God through Jesus, but the other half of that check was written by the things that you did. The good things that you did. The the boxes that you would check. And that goes against what Jesus proclaims in His Word. And as we explore God's grace, you see, sola gratia, grace alone, was a direct response to the Roman Catholic Church's view on merit. Now, merit is actually a a theological view, and and merit means um, that uh, it believes that a good work, a good work that is done in a person's life, actually places claim towards a future reward from God, meaning that, that what you do in this life, the good work that you do, that, that actually produces favor in God's eyes, and you then receive a reward because of that good work. That is the theological view of merit. And so grace alone challenges this. And so the key word in grace alone isn't the word grace because in some kind of twisted way the Roman Catholic Church and us today we do accept this idea of grace yes we can agree that God provides grace to us through Jesus Christ the key word though isn't grace it is what alone alone See, the contrast is probably 
most clearly understood by looking at two very distinct terms. Two very distinct terms. The first term is synergism. Synergism is basically means that salvation involves some form of cooperation between God and man, meaning that salvation is obtained to you or to me when God and man together cooperate to produce that result. That's synergism. The contrast to that is monergism. And that is that God works through the Holy Spirit to bring about the salvation of an individual regardless, regardless of that person's cooperation. See, reformers embrace the position that man is saved by the unmerited favor of God. Completely debunking the idea of merit and saying no. No. There is nothing a sinner does that results in God's grace. Everybody say, nothing. Nothing. There is nothing that a sinner does that results in God's grace. It is only the free gift of God, completely unworthy and undeserving. Would you please turn to Ephesians chapter 2. If you brought your Bibles, wonderful. I'm going to ask that you would turn to that. That's in the New Testament, following the the, uh, Gospels, one of the epistles written by the Apostle Paul. If you don't have a Bible, I've noticed there are Bibles in the seats in front of you. Um, And then, of course, the Bible in and on your smartphone is, in fact, the Bible. (laughs) Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to start with verse 1. And here... Here Paul is talking specifically about this issue of grace alone. So let's look at what the Word of God says in regards to this. Starting again with verse 1, chapter 2 of Ephesians. Paul writes this, he says, As for you, as for you, as for you, as for me, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, and all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we, we, all of us here, were deserving by nature, were deserving of wrath of judgment, of discipline, of death. But because of God's great love, because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions, even when we were completely separated from an almighty God. It is by what? Grace you have been saved. And God then raised us up with Jesus Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in the life of Jesus. For it is by what? Grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not... And this is not, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works. Not by works. Not by what you've done or or what you're going to do so that no one can boast. So that no one here can say, because I did this, I am now receiving the grace. No, it is not because of what you've done. It is only from the gift of God, for we are God's handiwork. God created us, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Charles Spurgeon, a famous preacher from the 1800s, he says this in response to this passage. He says that God forgives 
none because of payment made by them in any form. If we could possibly bring him mountains of gold and silver, they would be worth nothing to him. If we bring him tears and rivers or alms and alps or resolves, vows and promises in countless numbers, all will amount to nothing as a bribe of grace. Forgiveness, like love, is unpurchasable by us. God's pardons are absolutely free. He forgives because He chooses to forgive out of sheer pity for the sinner, out of clear, unmixed compassion, but with no adulteration of anything like a bribe or price. Can you think of anyone in your life, I'm sure you can, imagine someone in your life that you just hate finding a present for because they seem to have everything that they want or need. And so you end up just getting a $10 gift card to Applebee's or something, right? By the way, $10 gift cards to Starbucks, all right? Just that one. <laughs> In case you're wondering. But you, know, you have people like that, right? Or you struggle to know what it is that you can get them because you feel like that they have everything or they really don't want anything. And this God, the creator of all things, the almighty God, does he need anything from you or from me that he doesn't already have? Can he possibly need anything from us that he doesn't already have? And then what could we possibly give him that he doesn't already have or need? And then should we think for even a moment, for even a moment that the Almighty God, the Creator of all things, would be in a position that he would owe us? Is there something that we could give Him? Is there something that we could do for Him that would necessitate for Him to have to repay us? In Romans chapter 11, verse 35, Paul once again, he asks this question. He says, who has ever given to God that God should repay them? What's the answer to that question? No one. I love that. The Bible is jam-packed with sarcasm. I don't know if you ever noticed that. That's exactly what Paul's saying here. He says, who has ever given to God that God should repay them? No one. So what does that mean for us sinners? What does that mean for all of us? Because we are sinners. And if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you are a sinner saved by grace it means that what could we possibly do for ourselves to ensure that we would ever have a relationship with the perfect and holy god and we have to come to grips with the answer and that answer is nothing say nothing nothing we could do absolutely nothing to ensure that we've received grace from god we cannot check a certain amount of boxes. We can't measure up to a certain amount. We, we don't have to live a certain amount of time. We don't have to reach some spiritual plateau. Uh, nothing. We cannot lift a finger to save ourselves. Pastor John Sampson on his website, Reformation Theology, he says this. He says, grace alone... Grace alone means grace at the start, grace at the end, grace in the middle, grace without fail, grace without mixture, grace without addition, grace that allows no boasting, grace that precludes all glorying but in the Lord. All false concepts of grace would seek to eliminate all, uh, at least one of these clauses, but the biblical gospel stands firm. Unless grace alone is understood in this manner, man will always have some room 
for boasting. So what is the big deal here? Why is this why is this so important for us to really and truly fully embrace the fight against this instinctive tendency to be cynical about anything that could be free? Well, there's two reasons why this is important. The first is that God's grace, the grace that He wants so much to lavish on us through His Son, Jesus Christ, that it is enough. One of the biggest hang-ups for people that are searching for hope, for peace and life everlasting, who are considering a relationship with Jesus Christ, is they think, surely what I've done eliminates me from any consideration that God could ever forgive me. But if we can't lift a finger to save ourselves, if the only means of salvation comes solely and completely from God, then we have to embrace the fact that God's grace is enough. That means that nothing you've done. That means no matter where you find yourself today, no matter where life may and choices may bring you in the future, God's grace is enough. And then the second truth is that God's grace is limitless. It knows no end. It's like Bill Gates on steroids. All right, Bill Gates, he could, if he picked up a $100 bill, he would lose more money than he would gain by stopping to pick up that $100 bill. But even Bill Gates, if he just spent and spent and spent, he would go to $0. But that is not the case with God. God could never exhaust His funding of grace, meaning that it is limitless. It knows no end. Again, Charles Spurgeon says that God is not at risk of exhausting His stores of grace in pardoning transgressions and sins. And Charles Spurgeon says, and that is very good news for the sinner. Amen? Amen. See, because, because we were separated, because of sin, and we are all born into sin, none of us are immune from that sinful nature, because we are a sinful humanity, imperfect, and then you have a perfect holy God, there's this huge chasm, and the only way to rectify that was Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ his life of perfect righteousness is then counted as ours. And so when God sees us, He doesn't see us. When we give our life to Jesus, He sees Jesus. We were and we are incapable of saving ourselves even though we try. We try so hard in vain to do that. We try to measure up. We live in this culture of comparison. I have a love or hate relationship with Facebook. Facebook, I think, is a wonderful tool and resource when it's used in appropriate and healthy ways. But Facebook and Instagram and these other social media websites, they also fuel this attitude of comparison. And so we're looking at other people. And nobody ever posts anything showing the bad side of their life. It's all wonderful things. And so we start comparing ourselves to others. And then what that does in our lives is make us feel like we don't measure up. And so then we try so hard by checking those boxes. When we think about our relationship with God, we think, surely I need to be this in order to be made in order to be seen as valuable or worthy to God. But that's not what, what Scripture says. That's not how grace operates. There's this movie that I'd be surprised if there were three people in this room that have seen. It's a called About a Boy. There was a TV show made um, based on the same um, principle. But this is the movie that came out like 15 years ago with Hugh Grant. 
And in this movie, you don't need to know the story um, so much, but just a little bit of context. So Hugh Grant is this, um, this bachelor who's just kind of living his life without a care in the world, and he comes across this, this boy and develops kind of a friendship with him. But this boy has a mother who is suffering from depression and all sorts of issues, and she's suicidal. And she has a favorite song. And so he decides he wants to, he wants to help his mom, and, and so he decides to sign up for the talent show at his school and to sing her favorite song in front of his classmates. And this is what happens. That's us. That's us. Trying in vain trying in vain to, to receive some sort of achievement or recognition, trying to, 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 to be all that it is that we're hoping to be and saving ourselves, trying to lift that finger to save ourselves, but only falling short and receiving those boos. And so what did God do? He provided someone to, to save us. Jesus Christ, His one and only Son, God gave to die on the cross for our sins, and then to raise from the dead, having defeated death and provided for uh, life for us and life everlasting. And so in this movie, as Hugh Grant is standing on the sides and he's seeing this, he has to do something. And so check this out. Look at what he does. I, I love that scene because, you know, if they had ended, when, when they ended the song initially and everybody started, started cheering, you know, that, that was sweet. But you see, what would have happened is, is the, the attention would still be on that young boy. He would probably still be made fun of, you know, be picked on. But you see, what Hugh Grant did in that movie is similar to what Jesus did, because Hugh Grant knew that, that unless he made a fool of himself, that the attention would be on the boy. So he said, no, I'll take the booze. You guys make fun of me. You guys, you guys laugh at me. And that's what Jesus did. He said, I'll take that. I'll take that. There's this book uh, that was written uh, by Timothy Paul. It's uh, entitled Proof, Finding Freedom Through the Intoxicating Joy of Irresistible Grace. What an amazing title. And in this book, he shares a story about how he and his family decided to adopt an eight-year-old girl. And when they adopted this eight-year-old girl, they found out that she was previously adopted by another family who then dissolved that adoption and gave her up. And this family also unexplicably, unexplicably uh, decided to every year go to Disney World and instead of bringing her, they only brought their biological children. And so she would stay with some family friends while they went to Disney World. And so Timothy Paul, as he and his, their family decided to adopt her, they were determined to right this wrong. And so they made this, these big plans to go to Disney World for a vacation. And the months leading up to their trip, what was very strange, though, is this girl started acting out. She started treating everybody in her family horribly. And the, the behavior got worse and worse and worse and worse. And they were wondering, should we even do this? But they... They stuck with it, and they ended up going to Disney World. They had that first day there on the happiest place on earth at Magic Kingdom, and they got to their hotel room that night, and as Timothy was putting his new adoptive daughter to bed, he asked, how was your first day at Disney World? And she looked at him through tired eyes, and she said, I was able to go not because I was good, but because I'm yours. She had convinced herself because of, of not being able to go in the past that the reason she wasn't able to go to Disney World is because she wasn't good. But in that moment, she realized it has nothing to do with whether she was good or bad because she had been bad and bad the months leading up. No, the reason she went is because she was his. And that's us. That's us. In Isaac Watts' hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, we read these words and often sing them. 
were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life my all see the reason this is so important is that when we begin to understand the grace of God, the grace that we don't deserve that is only given because of Him, we begin to understand that it then should compel us to live lives that are thankful and honoring to Him because we are His. And the other reason why it's so important is in what James Montgomery Boyce writes, he says, if salvation is by the gift of God apart from human doing, that that means we can have it now. Now. And so for anyone in this room here today who is considering a relationship with Jesus Christ, let me tell you that that can be obtained now. You don't have to take a a test and get a certain grade in order to receive the free gift of God that comes through His Son, Jesus Christ. There's a song that was written a number of years ago. It's an African-American song that was written during the period of slavery, and it's one that I'm sure you've probably heard several times called, Give Me Jesus. And in those words, it says, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but but give me Jesus. That's what we're talking about here today. Jesus, way and the life, the grace that is provided freely to each and every single one of us. I pray that that would be our heartbeat today and as the week unfolds. Give me Jesus. I pray, Lord, that You would remind us of the magnitude of Your love so perfect that You lavish on us that we certainly don't deserve and that that would compel us today and this week, Lord, to give you the thankfulness, the gratitude, the honor and the glory that you rightly deserve and that it would compel us to want to share the truth of your love through Jesus Christ to others that desperately need it. We love you and we pray this in your holy and precious name and all of God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you so much for sharing this first of many wonderful days here at North Haven. I hope that you have a wonderful day today. Stay dry. God bless.